Um, we are running a bit late. This is the second presentation type thing that I've ever done, so sorry about that. Just blame me. Um, so I'm going to run through some other stuff with you. So again, yeah, if you're in it, the first one, something that I explained is, you know, this isn't written in stone. This is all like new technology, it's new things to play about with. No one really knows what the fuck we're doing. And I uh, love this tweet by Nicholas Gallagher. And you know, I was thinking to myself, you know, what if I was a new front end developer, you know, trying to get some code nowadays. And um, going back to you know, like, ten years ago or whatever, there wasn't a lot of information, whereas now we're just inundated with all these different technologies to look at. So you know, just don't worry about it because we're all still you know, like, learning. <coughs> So yeah, although that is the case, you know, like, this is something that we should consider because by 2015 it's predicted that mobile internet usage will actually outweigh desktop internet usage. And um, so what can we do? First of all, let's look at some of the issues. So, so we've already been over some of the issues. Um, there's this website which is pretty cool. If you have, again, all these slides as well will be available online. I'll stick the links up tomorrow. So. You know, it's just all these pitfalls of different things to be aware of. Uh, so that's one thing. Obviously, like various sizes. Uh, there's just a multitude of different sizes that we need to deal with. On, deal with. I'll go into that in a bit. Again, various imports. So I have the mouse. I've got this quick demo of this game that I love here. So I'm just going to do a quick demo. So this is basically just using my trackpad, and you move around, and you avoid these circles, I'll try and bump into one and finish it, so it's game over. Now what this dude's done is absolutely fantastic, he's taken that, and again I'll do a quick demo, hopefully, so <laughs> this is actually now from the webcam trying to detect my face, and fingers crossed, <laughs> so now if I, if I move up and down, it's like <laughs> Moving around. <laughs> <laughs> you do look mental, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's just, it's just fantastic. I mean, it's like, you know, I connect to our Wii, but it's just, this is available now in the browser. So these are things that, you know, we can use now in, to, you know, take, be able to take advantage of these things. And also, various uses scenarios. So again, like I mentioned about. Um, you know, if you're holding the device, obviously, you, know, you mentioned you know, where you can touch you know, the device. If you've got the navigation at the top, sometimes that's quite hard to get right up to the top. You want it down at the bottom, perhaps. You know, but there's all these native apps you know, that are out. It's just sort of become standard that the menu's at the top. So, again, right, it's not set in stone. You know, what is the best scenario we need to test these things to find out what's, what's, what's the best? Um, so, yeah, another pitfall is the media viewport isn't always what you think it's going to be. So I've got a few links here. One of the things that bit me is that some browsers take in the fact that they have got a scroll bar on the right and they'll add that pixel width to the viewport. Others don't. So obviously you need to be aware of this. And yeah, this way of stuff is going, going back to, you know, like the fact is this, you know, like an app or is it, you know, a website? I mean, you can have a web link that you type into your phone and you view the application. But it just seems so alien. It's like, well, you know, this is this is a link that I'm putting into my browser in my phone. This is a website. It's not an app where exactly it can just do exactly the same thing. So, just weird new stuff as well to be aware <laughs> uh, of. Well, uh, I know you mentioned about the, the M dot site. Uh, yeah, I'm personally not a fan. Can you, can you change that slide? Because it's really distracting. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned it. You know. <laughs> it, it has its, it, the end it does have its case scenarios, okay, but it just frustrates me that if someone sends me a link, especially like someone sent me a link to a product, and it said like M dot whatever, SKU name, whatever, but instead when I viewed it, um, it gave me the mobile experience, and then on a quick desktop, it actually just forwarded me to the home page, so then I couldn't see the product. So, yeah, although it's got, you know, it's use case scenarios, there's different things that you know, it can be used for, and things that can be on. So, yeah, <laughs> let's chill out, and there's, there's some things that we can... Think about. I, said, I, I wouldn't actually do MDOT, I would yeah. deliver different HTML for small devices, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't use MDOT, I would just let the app. Okay. Yeah. Can you say that we persuaded you about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, no, you know, it's a 
I was just only using them because it's quicker to say that than. Okay, right, exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> cool, so another thing, like going back to these different, um, different dimensions and things like that, is I've just put two examples here. Um, the first example, what it's basically doing is it's specifying a CSS file just for a particular width and device height and viewport orientation. Now, doing that is going to cause you loads of pain because you're going to have to. It might look great on a, an iPad one way, and then you'll do another style sheet for an iPad the other way, then another style sheet for an iPhone. But you know, this isn't right. Like, you can't just specify for different devices. There's so many different devices and devices that are coming up with all different types of viewport widths. So it's much better approach or a much better approach that I've found is to make it like indestructible. I'll be going on to that in a second and try and get ranges rather than just specifying exact pixel dimensions within your media queries. So Dan C. Home wrote this book a few years ago and I think it still stands true a lot of the ideas that he talks about. I'm a big fan of uh, Bruce Lee as well in, in this video, there's a link to that video it's describing about you know, like being water and then it can just, just flow like if it's in a cup or it's a bottle or a stream or whatever, you know, like it's, you're throwing at it, water will just flow and I think that's a really good analogy for how uh, responsive web design sites should work. So I've got a quick um, example here. So. Uh, the top box is like the bad news box, and the bottom one is the good news box. Um, so the top one has a fixed fixed dimensions on it. The other one has a media query. Again, like just a quick example, but just to show you how responsive can, can aid your design. And obviously, you know, if you can't see the content, then you're getting a bad experience. So. Okay, yeah, so Sam mentioned about the display norm thing. So it might seem like a really simple principle, but again, like when everyone was talking about responsive web design, primarily developers developing on large scale computers, and particularly with you know websites and code that's already existing. So you've already got this big like code base. So then it's like, oh shit, we need to you know, do this for the mobile app. So add all this extra stuff onto the mobile. So let's just hide everything. That we don't want to be shown, which is obviously really bad because you know you're still making those HTTP requests, and especially like if you're out and about on mobile, you've got 3G, you've got poor internet connectivity. The last thing you want to be doing is downloading like 1,600 pixel images that are absolutely humongous. So yeah, try and start off with something that's just going to be really quick as well. Like people are now just so impatient. So if you go to um, a site on your phone. Just show them something, even if it's anything. You know, I try and strip out the images or JavaScript if you're using that big JavaScript code base. Just try and serve just a simple HTML with a bit of CSS to say, look, you know, you connect it with working, something's going on here. And then try and maybe perhaps like load things in the background, but try and serve something to them as quick as possible to try and keep their interest going. Um, okay, so this is something that I want to show the first one that I didn't manage to, so fingers crossed, I'll give a quick example of uh, this application that I use called Live Reload. So, where's my text here? No, that's not what I want to Okay. Like I say, this is my second uh, presentation, so you have to bear with me. On the left here, I've got my browser, my new website, hits my five plate. On the right, I've got my code. So generally, like let's say if I want to change this text to green, so I change the text, then I go file, save, or you can use you know, your shortcut, and then I have to move my mouse over here, I have to click down, then I have to click this button here, or you can use the shortcut command that. Then I have to go back to my code. And you know, if you're making hundreds or thousands of changes a day, just flicking between the two can be quite boring, and it just adds up to quite a lot of time. So, live reload basically allows you to skip that process. So, um, you track the folder basically that you want it to compile each time and force it to the browser. And now, if I change anything in here, it just auto updates straight away. 
So it's, it's a massive win. It seems like a really small thing, but you know, over the duration of a day or week, year, it saves you absolutely loads of time. And um, I've actually done, uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to demo this, but uh, I've done a, a screencast video. Um, so in my home network, I was able to get live reload running through the devices as well. So I had an iPhone or an iPad or whatever, so I'm coding a local development environment on my machine. You just ask most of the updates on your devices to find that handy. So, yeah, go for it. So, is this you re reckon can be used for replacement? Is it for Adobe? Edge. Shadow? Shadow. 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 I've not used Shadow. I just you can basically connect up multiple devices and use this to be yeah, you can, auto refreshing against. Yeah, you set your, your local host against it, and then from your device, you just point to your machine, your local host. A bit faffing about with host files and configuration of your network. But, um, yeah, so that's cool. I've got that working. Um, it's a bit tricky nowadays with other things that I'm using, but I'll come to that in a second. So, there's these emulators as well that you can use. So, uh, you quick demo of this iOS. Is that only really for Mac? Um, yeah. Certain things like, yeah, live reload is just for Mac. Yeah, it's not, on it's, PC. Get it out on PC. It is available. Yeah, it works well on PC. Cool. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. I take it you're using a PC, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so in iOS 6, I uh, brought this in. In Safari, you go to your preferences and enable a uh, show developer menu in the menu bar. You can get this up there. And you can turn it on in the system preferences of the, uh, of the device as well. Thank you. Yeah. I've got um, a blog post there as well. Yes, this isn't the step you need to do. Um, but basically, what this enables you to do is <laughs> uh, you can just click your device there, and now you've got developer tools that can help you debug, and you can even uh, live code. So let's say, for example, And you can see that updating there, so it's really helpful to do both. Uh, another thing you need to be careful of is if you're using uh, a device um, to do this, um, be careful that you're not in like incognito mode or anything like that. Or, you know, like a restricted browser access because you won't be able to connect as well. But yeah, that uh, blog post there should help you out. If you get stuck trying to sort out with Michelle, I hope you're um, Adios man and Jake as well. Just done this absolutely fantastic video and it goes into depth now about how uh, how performance issues can you know cause issues within mobile devices and they do a brilliant demo uh, on Android devices and using the Chrome Dev Tools. Um, I mean, there's, there's just so so much like you can do with Chrome Dev Tools now. And look, who uses Chrome Dev Tools? I absolutely loads. Mm. And we still use Mozilla these days. Yeah. <laughs> HTML5 rocks, they've done all the... Adios Mani just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's all over the place, yeah. Um, and Opera? <laughs> <laughs> Links? Okay. <laughs> Block? Um, okay, so one, one thing you can do is if you've got spare time around, you can go down to it and uh, you know, set up a rig like this. Let's see if this video works. Sorry, no game. So, obviously that's a brilliant setup there, um, and what they do basically is you access your website there, it fires across to all these devices, including gaming. <laughs> so, obviously you know, not everyone's got £10,000 to spend, especially like with the current trend of how many devices are coming out. So. Um, there's this thing called Browser Stack. Does anyone use Browser Stack? Oh, I've tried it. Yeah. Unfortunately, I was going to do a demo, but my trials just ran out. <laughs> <laughs> so quickly, but it's about 11 quid a month, roughly, if you pay for a year subscription. And basically, what it does is you can just fire up any device, and it's got absolutely loads of devices on there. So like your Android devices, iOS devices, you can go like Windows uh, XP, Windows 8, 
uh, different, you know, I turn different versions of IE if you ever want to go and do that. Mm. Um, yeah. How do they find it? So? Well, touch. How do find it? Is it all flip or like, like, what? How does it, how does it do? There are different things like you can use, like touch, captain, touch. For example, um, like this sort of thing you can do with shortcuts. Um, I've not actually used it extensively for different uh, mobile devices, so I can't really answer that, I'm afraid, but I'll try and find out if you speak to me later, I'll get back to you. So, right? Um, okay, so Tom, is he about? Yeah, do you want so, to just give a, a quick shout out? Yeah, so Sam mentioned it before, uh, it's this thing called the Open Device Lab, right? All across Europe and a few in the UK, the idea is, is that obviously no one can afford those big rigs at home. The idea is if uh, people who live in their community can just contribute devices and we bring them all together in one place and then anyone who wants to use them can just come and use them for free. The most northern one in the UK was in Cambridge, so a few weeks ago we started one up here in Tech Up Manchester, so it started by Nightworld, which is the company that the guys who run Tech Up and me work on. Uh, so if you want to use it, it's downstairs, we've got, only got three devices at the moment, we're growing slowly, right? If you've got any devices that you'd be willing to contribute, then uh, please do that. But also, if you want to use it, then just like find us an email and you can use it anytime. Like, we've got an iPhone, we've got a couple of Android devices. Uh, the other thing as well is that you can use it for native development if you want to, so if you want to take it away for a few days, uh, better than using the dog slow Android emulators, uh, then feel free to do that as well. So yeah. Cool. Uh, you can tweet us like, so we're at uh, ODL North. Uh, we've got a little website as well, so yeah. yeah. I'll stick that on my blog as well. Like, definitely something we'll get growing. You know, just help us, help us out. I think I was speaking to uh, it's called David Blumen. I think he works for the, the BBC. You say what he does is every now and then we just take a day trip out and go around the supermarkets or whatever, and he'll go around Apple, like check them out, okay, and walk into a phone shop. Yeah, I'm after the uh, the new Nexus. Can you mm -hmm. have a look at it? Just check the site. Yeah, looks okay. <laughs> Actually, can I just try it on it and you know just go through them? So yeah, we were talking about um, SAS before as well. I again like about splitting the files up, something I like to do as well. Um, splitting up into <coughs> partials. So basically partials, again, it's just an easier way to structure your CSS into these different files that are more manageable. Um, and obviously version them. And obviously when you're versioning them, um, write decent commit notes. So quite often I'll find that I've wrote a particular bit of code and I've put a nice commit note with it and then I can just go and search back for that commit note and I'll find that code and I can just copy and paste it. <laughs> so, uh, as well, yeah, when you're doing these, all this authoring in pre processes and things like that, um, there's these different things that can help you. So, build scripts are brilliant and are really helpful. So, you've got your development environment set up on your local machine, loads of comments to remind your future self when you come back to it six months why the fuck you did something. And build scripts will just basically minify everything for you, optimize the shit out of everything, and push it live for you. So, they're absolutely awesome. Um, yeah, so there's a few there to so go and check out. Um, source maps, has anyone used source maps oh, yeah. with, within SAS? No. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. Um, so originally there was this thing called FireSAS within Firefox, and what it does is it tells you the corresponding <coughs> uh, line number that you're editing within your SAS file, which makes it a lot easier to debug and author and you know, find out where you are in your SAS files. But, one problem with that is that you end up with this code in your in your files. So if you're then doing like a diff on these files to see what changes have been made, if someone else has edited it, you're collaborating this project. So in this example, it's someone called Richard. If I came to it, if the file so it's a thousand lines long, it would show diff for you know a thousand lines, which is obviously you know, impossible then to find out the actual bit of code which has just been changed. So there's this thing that sort of, and uh, uh, Chris Epstein, I think he did Compass, he's just got a job now working at LinkedIn, and um, we've got a vlog about that, so he's going to have hopefully more time to devote to this, so hopefully, um, and also the proceeds of any donations from tonight will be going to Chris Epstein as well, so hopefully he'll, he'll have a look at that, wink wink, because it's awesome. So yeah, I mean, touch the games, you know, like testing, and that's, that's what I think, you know, Need to do. We need to test, 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 test as much as we can. Find out what these issues are. Find different ways of trying to fix these issues and reporting these issues. And you know, like talking about it and seeing what's working and what's not working. 
and if you don't test, then bad things can happen. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for watching. Um, again, sorry, like it overran a bit and done that a bit quick, but hopefully, all this is recorded and I'll put a blog post up about it and all the links and everything like that. Um, also, I'm going to put another Google form up, so it's really helpful. You can give me your feedback, you know, what you want to see. Um, future threads, you know, if you want to talk, if there's anything, you know, any suggestions whatsoever, then that would be really helpful. So, thanks a lot.